is growing. It's the sign time. So, okay, so um, uh, good evening um, or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to Shumukra Chidri and very happy that uh, you are here for the special Ayuka Colloquium. We've been doing these colloquia from the beginning of April every week and sometimes particularly for people in time zones that are not very convenient, we have a, a special colloquium, which is later in the evening. And I'm happy to see, even though it is um, encroaching on many people's dinner times, that uh, we have quite a lot of people here, um, uh, here to hear about the Vera Rubin Observatory. Our speaker today, I'm very happy to say, is Michael Wood Basie, who um, is um, uh, very much in charge of various aspects of uh, LSSD. He did his PhD in Berkeley uh, with uh, very famous names, Palmuder and Smoot, and, and then was a postdoc at, uh, <clears throat> at, at the CFA at Harvard um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and then uh, with the Supernova Essence project, the Supernovae, um, of course, um, um, and, and uh, he's an expert on, on supernova cosmology. Um, he has been a faculty, um, a member of the faculty at the University of Pittsburgh uh, from 2008 and is currently an associate professor there. Um, of course, uh, he's been involved in the um, SDSS3 uh, and has been involved with the LSST, which is now part of what is known as the Vera Rubin Observatory um, uh, for more than a decade currently. Um, the executive board chair of the LSST Corp. And uh, we are looking forward to hearing about more about LSST and Vera Rubin Observatory for him. Over to you, Michael. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for the accommodation. Uh, I'm very happy to speak. It, it is, I've always wanted to, to visit Pune. Um, it's been on my list for sort of a decade and, and this is not the same, but I'm glad to have been able to participate in a small way. Um, I'm a professor, so I have learning goals and objectives for this talk. And if I fail in conveying enough information for any of these, definitely hold me to account in your questions. But I hope we can describe the Rudin Observatory, the telescope, and the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. That's sort of how we've kept the LSST brand after the survey. Explain the key science themes for LSST. And I'm really involved in the Dark Energy Science Collaboration. So I have lots of thoughts and ideas about that. Uh, those would be the secondary focus, uh, but you should at least, I hope, be able to describe what that is. Um, and then part of the point of this is how IUCA can contribute to LSST and certainly more broadly, you know, the, the greater uh, Indian scientific community who is interested. Um, I very much want to see everyone involved and there are various details and complications, the partnership model, but I think at the base, better science get done when more people are working together. So first, let me just give a brief overview and introduction to the Vera and Rubin Observatory, the project and the facility and some of the science. So this is the rendering that was done uh, over a decade ago, sort of showing the shape of the building. And the shape is ch carefully chosen to um, make the airflow work uh, across the site. The mirror is about is 8.4 diameters, but it's a very interesting design where the inner annulus is actually um, effectively the tertiary mirror. It doesn't converge or reconverge, so it's not quite a tertiary, but it's um, another reflecting surface. So the effective area is a uh, collecting area is six and a half meters. But the, one of the key things to go with this wide, uh, large mirror is a 10 square degree camera. So just as a reminder, right, the moon is sort of half degree. So we're fitting about 40 moons in the field of view. And this is the huge difference in capability. We've built big mir mirrors before but always with very small fields of view for imagers or very small for spectrographs, right? But um, being able to do survey at this scale is what's unprecedented. When we're sort of recapturing, actually we're not even at sort of the Palomar plate stale survey, but we're at least getting there at 10 square degrees. This can be in Sarah Pachon, 
um, in Chile. This is near the Gemini telescopes, near the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory telescopes. That's at minus 30 degrees latitude, just to sort of keep that part in your head. With that wide field of view, the LSST survey uh, will, over 10 years, observe 18,000 square degrees, covering the visible sky every three nights. So in a little more detail, here's one way of doing that. So the region from declination zero to minus 60 is of course just plus, minus, plus 30 minus 30 on either side of the latitude of the telescope. Um, we're going a little higher to cover um, the uh, ecliptic plane a little bit um, and a little higher uh, for giving some bits of the galaxy um, for a little completeness there. Uh, but the main idea is to get at the plus minus 30 degrees where we can get the best seeing quality. Um, one of the key drivers is doing a weak lensing survey to look for dark matter or to characterize and measure uh, the effects of dark matter on the light intervening. And so that's sort of key. And that's another reason you see the, the galaxy there. So the galaxy is blue. The, the, the line at the center of the galaxy is blue on that and coming through. We're covering the galaxy, um, but not as deep. So the deepest is gonna be the extragalactic field. Whereas the galaxy we will reach depths such that we'll be confusion limited pretty quickly, but we'll keep covering that for transients, whether it's exploding stars, micro lensing events, or varieties like that. Some key numbers. So 8.4 meter diameter, 6.4, 6.5 .4, equivalent area. It's an F1.2, which I sort of said very indirectly when I said that it was a big mirror and a big field of view. But this is that key difference, right? Old reflectors might be like F18, you know, the whole huge things. Then we got a little better and maybe we're at F5 for some of the, the you know, Gemini or something like that. F1.2 is really, really fast. And that's what's allowed us to get the wide field of view. But it actually also means that your plane of focus is very, very sharp. Um, so it's required a significant degree of engineering specification on the camera. Um, the goal of the survey is a reach of photometric accuracy and um, of 10 millimags, so 0.01 magnitudes, 1%. An astrometric accuracy of 50 milli arc seconds with a repeatability of 10 milli arc seconds. And the distinction is just the ability to do relative measurements versus calibration to some more global scale based on quasars, radio sources. And of course, Gaia now will be the reference uh, for that. As a brief sense of the limiting magnitudes, there'll be six filters, U, G, R, I, Z, Y. These are special, very thick 300 micron CCDs um, that allow for the increased Z band and Y band sensitivity. In one visit with this large mirror, we're getting down to 24th magnitude, 25th in G and I, uh, G and R. But in 10 years, when we have hundreds of images, we'll be able to get down to 26, 27th magnitude, 27th and a half for these. And that is a huge change in the limiting magnitude, but more generically, the surface brightness limits of what we can achieve. Just as a brief sense of the camera. So to get 3 billion pixels, that's 189 science chips at 0.2 arc seconds per 10 micron pixel for a 10 square degree field of view. And for those of you who you know, didn't get a chance to scribble out the arithmetic of what that means, this image over here, the camera, that is the size of a car. That's how big this camera is. Uh, not a huge car, but still it's a small and somewhat long car. You can see that the um, filters are housed around the camera. So the red cutout thing there, that's a filter. It, isn't cut out, it, we're just showing the plane. But that's one filter. And the other filters are stored to the size of the camera. So um, actually experts in geometry will notice that you can only fit four circles around a cylinder of that same size. So we have some plan that you have to switch in a filter and out a filter um, in the bright moon and, and low moon conditions. But that's a minor detail. But again, every field of view 
has 10 square degrees. That's 10 million galaxies down to the sensitivity limits. And each field will be about 800 times. In addition, there will be, still being decided, something on the order of five deep fields that we'll try to visit as often as we can, nightly, every two nights in separate filters, something like that. And we'll go much deeper in those fields and get very nice time resolution for things that vary in time. As a comparison, I'd say the deepest and highest quality uh, optical survey right now is the Hyper Supreme Cam as part of the Super Strategic Program. That was 300 nights, GRIZ, uh, plus some interesting narrowband filters. That was about 1400 square degrees, with the deep being 27 and the ultra deep being 3.5. The LSSD will do that an eight, 10 times larger, 18,000 square degrees. The deep field's now at 50 square degrees. And the number, uh, the, the depths are getting down to maybe 29th in RNI and the, and the deepest fields. So just to give a sense of what that looks like, here's just a simulation of what that looks like. And it is correct to take away from this that there are galaxies everywhere. So in the optical, we are actually starting to hit some of the confusion limits that have plagued, entertained uh, people in the mid-infrared, near-infrared, IR, um, far IR, and radio uh, forever. Uh, and so actually distinguishing all the different galaxies is one of the key imaging challenges of getting the best that's out of there. So there'll be 20 billion galaxies, the same number of stars, catalog of six million solar system objects and everything that changes or moves during the night, there's a new point that's changed in brightness or it's moved, um, will be published to the world in 60 seconds. So anyone can follow things up. Um, things like AGN that are known to vary, all uh, AGN are gonna vary at some point, there'll be a hundred million of those. And then my own personal interest in supernova cosmology, there will be on the order of a million supernova with very well calibrated photometry. Um, I think specifically just because I'm thinking about it for type 1a supernova, we estimate a little more conservatively that we should be able to get 100,000 supernova with uh, excellent calibration and good control of systematics. As a comparison, sort of the state of the art a few years ago was about 1,000 supernova. Um, pan stars and then now DES are pushing that up to maybe about 5,000 supernova. And so 100,000 uh, will be a qualitative change. And it's one of the key reasons I got involved in this several, um, well, over 10 years ago, yes. Okay, here's what an 8.4 meter mirror looks like. So this is after it was cast. And if you haven't thought about how large mirrors are made, that honeycomb structure is in there because the glass is actually not that thick because you want it to be light. So the glass goes down into the honeycombs, then it's uh, polished off. The honeycomb structures are removed and those become the mount points to support the mirror because a very heavy mirror will deform. Um, and also it will have a high degree of thermal inertia. So it'll be hard to keep the temperature control to get the focus. So these are actually pretty thin relative mirrors. This mirror was one of the key parts of kicking things off. Um, 15 years ago, and was a general, generous gift from the Charles Lisa Simone Fund, along with support from Bill Gates. And uh, this was on the order of 20, 30 million dollars to get the mirror cast and done. Um, and the LSST Corporation, uh, which was the sort of the thing pushing things forward there, was key in sort of obtaining that philanthropic uh, contribution that years later sort of unlocks the public money to support this more generally. So speaking of years later, here is uh, the mirror in 2019 in the University of Arizona Mirror Lab after having been coded, uh, sorry, not, not um, after having been polished down, will be coded at the summit. Um, there's a blue protective layer over it, that protective layer, it will peel off uh, cleanly and perfectly. I just wanted to illustrate here a little bit. So M1, the first reflective surface is the annulus on the outside. There's a secondary uh, the, that's not pictured here. It's a hyperbolic secondary. 
and then the mirror light comes back down to M3 and then goes back up to that small car size camera. Um, this year, the uh, or actually late 2019, um, the mirror made its way up to the summit. There's one tunnel they measure really carefully and drive really straight, uh, but it made it up to this summit and it's um, stored in a shed right now on the site. There is also what's pictured in this, there's a mirror blank. So this is just a big section of something about the same mass and weight um, and size of the mirror that they'll use to test putting the mirror into place on the telescope assembly. So that's just a brief overview of what the survey uh, will accomplish, some of the designs, some of the hardware that's happening. 10 year survey, six and a half meter effective area mirror, half the sky uh, to start in a couple of years. So running this decade. Now for some complicated details. So there are a bunch of different parts of this. So the Varese Rubin Observatory is the construction project that is building the camera, that's building the telescope, that's building the site, that's building the computing facilities, that's building the software, all the parts. And the end of construction is slated for 2022. Then the Rubin Observatory facility and operations will be the part that runs the telescope. Um, and that's gonna be the unit, unit U.S. National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy uh, through Aura and then Slack as the operating partners uh, will operate it. And will operate the facility and deliver the data. And then, this is a key point, the Rune Observatory welcomes international participation through in-kind contributions. So things that help out the science, um, help out more broadly the U.S. astronomical community, but most of these make more sense in the context of doing science with LSST. Then there are the LSST science collaborations. So the science collaborations are groups of interested people who've gotten together and organized to advocate for LSST to plan out what science they want to do. You don't have to be a member of a science collaboration to do science. The data are public to all of the data rights holders. Um, and in fact, all the data become publicly um, available two years after they are published uh, to the data rights holder community. Um, but if you're interested in doing something with LSST, it's useful to just be a member at least of a science collaboration to get at the lay of the land and get some thinking and talk to some people about that. Then there's the LSST Corporation, which was the initial thing that got the project started, that got the money for the project, uh, for the mirrors. Um, and now that the operations, uh, the construction operations is taken over by the agencies and their um, contractors or in Slack, uh, the LSST Corporation is focused now on raising money through private philanthropy to support LSST science. And one of the aspects is actually trying to understand how that works internationally as well. So here are all, so there are a bunch of different parts that fit together, just like all the different pieces of the camera that fit together. So here's a picture of part of the camera uh, raft integration. And you can see that that module is three by three CCDs, nine CCDs that's being put in. There are 21 of those rafts and nine times 21 is 189. So those are the main 20 uh, rafts. And then up in the upper left corner of here, you see some funny shaped rectangular ones that are like this and that. And those are the wavefront sensors to detect the focus um, at every image. We take the focus or actually sub images, they can be read out separately. So I like this image both because it's really cool to see because this is a huge uh, camera and focal plane and a huge clean room, but also that metaphor of the pieces fitting together. So let me spend a little time talking about the international participation in LSST. I kind of have to start just saying, I don't formally work for the Rubin Observatory project. My most formal relationship is I'm the LSST Dark Energy Science Collaboration Data Coordinator. And that role I'm speaking for desk, I was sort of invited by the desk spokesperson to come here. I mean, as part of uh, sort of was inviting. So I speak for desk. I'm not formally speaking for the project, the operations, anyone else. However, I've followed this process a lot, and I personally would very much like to encourage uh, and help a wide community participate in the LSST science, the overall endeavor. 
So this year, uh, sorry, a little last year, and then going to this year has been a process for the first round of solicitations of in-kind contributions and proposals. Um, there's a pre-proposal process, letters of intent, um, and the project welcomes contributions to operations um, or the greater science. Some construction, but at this point, there aren't that many that opportunities left where that's really that efficient. Um, but some further examples, dedicated software staff, computing resources, data sets, follow-up facilities. So here are a few links. If you really care, you've probably already been following and I'm happy to talk about this a little more. Uh, but one date very much in the mind of people who are currently interested is that the proposals are nominally due in, in um, less than two weeks. So there's been one round and there's been some feedback about that. I'd say the short summary of this process is that um, directable software effort can be pretty effective. And so it's um, the nominal exchange rate is one year of a software directable effort. So this can be a computer programmer who knows enough about astronomy to be useful. It can be a postdoc in astronomy or physics who knows enough computer programming to be useful. Um, and one year of that person's time buys data rights for one principal investigator plus four of their junior associates. Nominally, those are postdocs or grad students, but in different scenarios, those could be some research staff, details to be determined uh, for the full 10 years. So that could be relatively competitive um, and uh, I think can be good opportunity because that person who's doing that work is probably working with some group whose science interests you were interested in. So the idea is that it's most flexible to have directable effort, but that will be associated with some group, uh, some science collaboration, probably uh, where the effort fits in. And hopefully that investment also becomes part of what helps build a greater connection with the broader LSST science community. So here we are today, the focal plane has been completed. The camera is still in the lab. So through a pinhole, it took a picture of Vera C. Rubin, who made key contributions actually to many things, but specifically one of the reasons it's particularly appropriate is to dark matter. And originally the conception of the Rubin Observatory uh, effort, the LCT survey, it was called the Dark Matter Telescope because it was really formed to look at for dark matter. This was just around 2000, late 90s. And then of course, as dark energy became also clearly this completely unexpected thing, it was merged for both of those things. But something like weak lensing that's looking at the structure of matter, um, uh, dark matter, but how that evolves through cosmic time, you're looking at both those effects of dark matter, but also how the dark energy and dark matter interplay affect the large scale structure, uh, both that you can see in visible galaxies, but also in the effect of the shear on the light. So, um, the camera works. The camera is going some final integration and commissioning and testing and will be shipped uh, once conditions improve and, and we can resume full uh, construction um, activities. Just another mention about the LST Corporation. The corporation really exists as a um, philanthropic entity uh, to raise money for LST science. And in one of my roles, I'm the vice chair of the executive board for the LCT Corporation. And we're pursuing both small scale and large scale um, private philanthropy to support the science and to support education efforts. There is $9 million in the Rubin Observatory construction project to build the infrastructure and modules and tools to allow the sharing of all the ideas and to use the data from Rubin Observatory and the LCT survey to engage with students to provide activities. But just like the science needs to be funded, the educational efforts also need to be funded because someone actually has to be there in the classroom or organizing this or that. Um, anyway, so we're pursuing activities on both those fronts. We're talking to a number of different foundations who have different interests. Some foundations are all about the education. Others are like, I want great software engineers making things better in astronomy. Um, and many of the philanthropists are relatively multinational cosmopolitan people. 
and their perspective can be pretty international as well. So the LCT Corporation has a goal of focusing on its members of the corporation. There's an annual dues to the corporation, um, but the wider scientific and public community is part of the broader interest. If you're interested in becoming an institutional member, there is the link. That is my plug for that. Back to pictures of hardware. So speaking of fitting things together, just to remind yourself, this is that filter changer. This is built in France. It was shipped to Slack. It'll be put around the camera. Um, that's, as you gathered, two people standing inside the filter changer. And so the filters are going to go on the outside, uh, or you know, um, sorry, the inside of that structure um, to, to change the filters. That's how big this is. There are four broad science themes that drove the construction of Rubin Observatory and the LSST survey for these 10 years. There's the solar system, there's cosmology, there's the Milky Way, and then there's transients. Out of these four themes, there are eight active science collaborations. There's a science collaboration about the solar system, galaxies, active galactic nuclei, transients and variables, information and statistics, informatics, um, trying to help basically all the other science collaborations or any of the users of, of Rune Observatory data on statistical questions, right? If I have two of a thing, I can write a paper about this one and that one and talk about how they're the same or different. If I have a million of something and I'm trying to figure out if there are four classes or if there's some continuum or what's going on, uh, then I might need a little help to think about and draw the base science um, inference out of that. And if I might just say a little bit, so Chad Schaefer is at Carnegie Mellon University, which is just across the street from the University of Pittsburgh, and their astrophysics group has really, truly been excellent. Um, and they really like people with actual data who want to do actual science, and they want to help that actually happen. There's STARS, Milky Way, and the local volume. These actually started out separate. And then I realized one of the things LSST does is it, enable, it pushes our reach at all scales. It pushes us farther out in the solar system so we can see um, transatomian objects. It pushes us farther in the galaxy so that we're, not, we're actually seeing stars all the way out to um, Andromeda and throughout the local volume. So those collaborations merged as they saw that that was sort of what LSST was going to enable the mapping. Strong lensing and the dark energy science collaboration, which I spend most of my time thinking most directly about. There's so much in the solar system. I'm just highlighting one particular science case here, but again, just some of the numbers. There are currently about 15,000 near Earth objects known. The LSST survey will find 100,000. It will increase that number by a factor of 10. There are currently 700,000 main belt asteroids. LST will increase that number by a factor of 10. And very similarly for Jupiter Trojans. So these are asteroids that are in the Lagrange points from Jupiter, so plus 60 minus 60 around that. Um, and then transheptunian objects, things that have just been too faint to be seen before. It will um, increase those by number of 20. And then a whole new category we found these two really interesting interstellar asteroids, comets, what have you, objects. Rough estimates of the current rates say, well, if we found two just based on what we're doing, LSST should find at least 10. That will be pretty cool. Um, active asteroids. So asteroids, generically speaking, are thought to have been processed and not have that much ice left over. It's the comets that are coming in from the Oort cloud or something that are going to have some processing, all that. But that's not quite true, right? So asteroids have activity. And so this area of being able to track things just as they move in the sky, but also their changes in brightness and surface profiles and, and things um, is going to be a key part. And so here's just a highlight of some interesting active asteroids from a paper by um, Jewett. The solar system, the system project has a roadmap for its infrastructure needs. It has a software roadmap for what it needs. So if one's thinking about directable contributions or ways to fit in, you won't care about solar system, it's right there and they'd be totally happy to talk to you. So galaxy science qua galaxies, not as backlights for weak lensing, but the evolution of galaxies over 
95% of cosmic time. And again, the key, not just the depth directly, but the surface brightness you're going down. If you compare, for example, an image from SDSS to one taken by Subaru of that same field, you see not just so much more galaxies, you see the full shape. So for example, um, Chris Mijos has been spending uh, decades uh, trying to get very low surface brightness observations in, um, sorry, my mind's blanking, Virgo um, cluster. And you can start to see the interactions between all these galaxies. On the right is an image from actually from SDSS of two galaxies. And the last is the simulation in the middle under LSST. Uh, these two galaxies happen to be physically associated. Um, what if you had some of those same structures that we see in the nearby clusters throughout all these galaxies? It would tell us so much about how those galaxies formed, how many major and minor mergers they'd have, whether or not galaxies are interacting. Um, so it's just really fascinating things just about galaxy. I'm just touching the surface, scratching the surface for all of these. AGN. AGN are in the cores of galaxies, but inherently variable things, the name active. They're revisible out to a redshift of seven. Um, they can probe through the Lyman alpha force to high redshifts and use spectra, spectra to really measure that. And then AGN are such that classic multi-wavelength thing, combining radio data and X-ray data and um, near infrared from space missions like Euclid W first. Uh, radio data, ASCAP, Miracat, some of those. They're just giving that full picture of what's happening. And we'll have about 100 samplings per band over 10 years for AGN. Um, and then, of course, the astrometry itself of, of those AGNs, since those are distant but bright point sources, is very good. Except for a really interesting thing. So LSSC does not have a differential um, atmospheric dispersion corrector. That's the thing that takes out the fact that if you're looking through the atmosphere at an angle, you're looking through a prism. The optical design didn't allow putting one in because it's just so hard to get that right across such a flat, uh, wide field of view. Uh, so quasars, which for the same color of quasar have a different spectrum than the same stars, their light will get spread out differently, which will be yet another interesting way to um, identify the quasars and separate that they're not stars. Transients and variables. So this is a huge category from supernova to nova to, um, I guess, AGN or subset of that, but in some sense, they're, they're just their own separate thing. Um, there are whole classes of characteristic time scales that we haven't probed. So for supernova surveys, we look for things every three days because a supernova takes months to rise and fall and at higher redshifts, that's redshifted out. Um, time dilated and it takes even longer. So we haven't been looking at those scales. So we want to drive faster scales, but still do that a wide field uh, across the sky. And then trying to make sense of all of this. So the statisticians say we're shifting from the variance dominated to the bias dominated. I think the astronomer might say we're shifting from the statistics to the systematic limits. Um, but I think the statistics point is you have to think about it, doing this in some different ways and what do you mean by classification and what do you mean by um, characterization of things and i think there's some really interesting opportunities there to make better science not just fun sort of toys or whatever but better science learning new things about the universe through new techniques every generation of surveys sdss dark energy survey they've been wide field surveys have found new streams of satellite galaxies from around the Milky Way. For LSST, we'll be able to push that out to Andromeda. We'll understand the history of streams throughout sort of the local volume. And we'll be able to construct a history of consistently how all those things formed. And then the very rare, so strong lensing, let's say galaxy, galaxy lensing. When you have a galaxy here, the light is getting um, focused down galaxy galaxy lenses, those are relatively rare, only about a thousand known. So expectations for the LSST survey are that you would get thousands of lensed AGN. You would get a hundred thousand galaxy galaxy lenses. 
thousands of lensing clusters, and even hundreds of lensed supernova. So type 1a supernova are great because you know their brightness, you know the relative brightness, and you can measure how far away they are. But imagine you had a multiply imaged type 1a supernova, like being lensed by my head or something, right? So it's back here and you see this image and you see this image and you see this image and you see that image and they're each traveling a different distance. So there's a time delay. So you're both measuring the relative brightness and you're directly measuring H naught because of that simple geometry about that. So that would be really a fascinating way uh, to touch and address those. And strong lensing just gets two slides because they have the coolest pictures. Um, but the idea is that you can use these as magnifying glasses that also are telling you about time uh, throughout the universe. And you just need something like LSST to find them. You need something with low surface brightness limits and a wide sky coverage. We'll pause, look at some pretty pictures. Here's the current status of a, a building. So this is the Rubin Observatory. That building looks a lot like the picture. It has the characteristic sloped um, uh, roof line to smoothly connect with the hill. It also diverts some of the waste heat away correctly from the computing center and the stuff that are up there. The dome is almost fully covered. Uh, the telescope mount assembly is being installed uh, right now. And the secondary mirror, so the secondary is upside down right now in this picture because it's on the floor, but the secondary will be up like this. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, shaped this way. It uh, has been coated by the coating chamber on site, uh, and it's been very, very successful uh, with some fantastic reflectivity projects. All right. So the Dark Energy Science Collaboration, which in many ways encapsulates many of the reasons I became scientifically personally invested in LSST, although I must say that the mission of sharing the whole sky with well, everyone first in the US and Chile and hopefully more and more international partners um, really spoke to me that bringing the ability to have large telescopes just getting you whatever photometric imaging data you wanted, uh, wherever, on half the sky that you wanted, uh, just seemed like such a great equalizer about things. But specifically in cosmology, bigger is better. Larger surveys are better for most cosmological probes. And covering the sky more often is better. So for example, this 1987 you know, having that ability to see something as it explodes, catch something in hours as it goes up. So the Dark Energy Science Collaboration formed to make the most accurate cosmological measurements from the LSST data in the context of a collaboration that really wanted to work together. I've worked in collaborations where it took me years to figure out that, oddly enough, the people all in the collaboration didn't want to work together. That surprised me. That was confusing. So actually, one of DESK's missions is to not be that, is to be clearly, we all wish to work together and make that work. And by being inclusive and supporting everyone, we can get better work done, better discussions and better science. So DESK is approaching cosmology through supernova, near and dear to my heart, by measuring the brightness of a supernova. Over time, you can find, Simplistically, you can find its peak brightness. We fit the full light curve and more complicated, but basically you say, how bright was it? And what was its redshift? And then I can tell you how the universe has expanded since I observed the whole set of supernova. So this is a very early figure from um, just the discovery of dark energy itself. From the high Z supernova team, then there's a supernova cosmology project. So this was 100 supernova. LSST will give us 100,000. So just as one very simple way of thinking about this, Let's say you wanted a thousand supernova, which was the state of the art a few years ago in type 1a supernova cosmology. You can now do that in a hundred different directions on the sky. Is dark energy homogeneous, isotropic? Those are some of the key questions. Uh, and then we can just start answering those with this wealth of data. Strong lensing to do these cosmographic time delays to measure the geometry of these systems by measuring what the time delays are from multiple images. 
This comes great from supernova and AGN uh, through time correlations also provides some useful data. But as the light is bent around that gravitational lens plane, you get the delays of the different images and you get that tells you the distance that those traveled and the geometry of the system. Then there's large scale structure. So large scale structure here means of the observed galaxies, how galaxies form and the structures of the sky set by the dark matter clusters and filaments. And by looking at this power spectrum of um, variation over the different scales, there's specific predictions from um, sort of model of uh, the initial fluctuations growing into the acoustic oscillations, then collapsing and growing into structures that actually become sensitive to the details, um, certainly of the expansion itself, because the dark energy uh, driven expansion of the universe kind of helped freeze out some of the growth of structure. So um, that's part of those probes of doing that. And they're studying how galaxy clusters themselves evolved. So there'll be thousands of galaxy clusters. And studying how the structures of that is telling you how at the most intersection of these filaments of structure, how things formed at different times because clusters are where things form fastest. The most massive galaxies form the quickest. You have a great sampling of different ways that the galaxies formed. And then you have a sampling of how our galaxies and then the dark matter are distributed around them. You can see in this picture, um, which is a true HST picture of a cluster on the frontier fields. Um, you can see that there are all these little arcs and those are distant galaxies that have been lensed by this cluster. And that was giving you the mass map of this cluster. And you can compare that to the baryons distributed in the cluster as one way of trying to understand the structure of how that cluster formed. But then just the formation of clusters themselves, the number of clusters a function of redshift and how quickly they formed is a key part that is also related to how the universe has been expanding. When did structure uh, freeze out? When did structure uh, form the fastest? And then weak lensing, which is really what's driving some of the amazing optical requirements for the Rubin Observatory uh, and the camera. If you have a background of galaxies, let's say on the left, and you lens them by having some network of dark matter in between. This is exaggerated for clarity. But the light from each of these will be stretched because it was pulled a little this way or pulled a little that way from the gravitational lensing from all of those. So the weak lensing regime is where it just stretches the shapes. The strong lensing regime is when you get multiple images. But weak lensing is incredibly powerful about this, particularly because you are um, sampling the integration of all the effects along the line of sight and some different redshift bins. So we anticipate there'll be about 3 billion galaxies with LSST that will be really well measured and characterized to build these tomographic maps of the weak lensing um, shear and thus of the dark matter. And just as a special mention, because it's in our minds as much as our um, LIGO colleagues are not with us today. Um, Kilonova, which have certainly become very much in our interest uh, since the LIGO uh, Kilonova um, Association from a few years ago. LSST will find lots of them. So are there gonna be lots that are LIGO detections, not detections? How common are they? What's the thing? And just in general, this idea that things that we've seen between zero and one of now, we will see in between zero and a thousand of in the area of LSST. So the Dark Energy Science Collaboration's goal is to do accurate and precise cosmology. So by combining all these different probes, which tend to have different biases, different systematics. And if we look at the um, evolution of the dark energy equation of state, so this is um, something like WA versus W0, then the red is sort of the current state of the art. Um, and black is what we think we can get to. And I'd say the key, key thing here is we are just starting to be able to put constraints as a water cosmological community on WA, on, on the evolution of the dark energy equation of state with time. That's difficult. LSST really offers an amazing opportunity to use all of the different probes to get really interesting and limiting constraints on the dark energy equation of state. 
Now, this picture is not what we get in the first year. This is after a number of years of data. But by having a coordinated approach now and working together, we can think we can do the best statistical and systematic error um, constraints and a joint probe analysis for this. I just wanna mention one project of DESK, which is the Data Challenge 2, which is a simulation of a virtual LCT sky survey. We have simulated 300 square degrees over uh, five years, uh, together with one deep drilling field, it's smaller, just one square degree. But to understand our ability to do science and to really be ready. So when the data come, we know what the difference in the simulations and the data are, and we can really put out the results and understand um, what our sensitivities are. So this slide says aiming for 2020 public release. As with many things, that's gotten a little shifted. We definitely are planning to do that in 2021. Um, we have the paper describing this in the final stages of preparation right now. But we took a cosmological input uh, in body simulation and seeded the galaxies. We used a detailed image simulation and then we process them with the current state of the art of the data management science pipelines from the Rubin Observatory. We've run image subtractions um, and we've done analyses and they all seem to work well. And it's really helped us validate our data ahead of time. We've even gotten to the point of starting to validate our two-point correlation function. And um, for the three different measurements, you can look at the shear shear correlation of galaxies. You can look at the correlation between the shear of a galaxy and the distribution of galaxies, and you can look at the galaxy galaxy correlations. And these are all related to each other. And we're doing we've done successfully a joint analysis of these and done a shear map out of this simulated uh, catalog. So I hope that you now can describe the LSST survey and telescope. Six and a half meter effective area, 18,000 square degrees over 10 years, 10 square degree field of view. The four key science themes for LSST, cosmology, Milky Way, solar system, and transients. And then the Dark Energy Science Collaboration is a large international collaboration, really dedicated to getting the best cosmology with LSST. And we have large existing infrastructure into which efforts can fit um, and contributions are welcome. And then I think for IUCAA, more generally um, across India for people interested, but I think out of all the different contribution models, the directable software efforts um, are easiest and I think actually a pretty good deal because the person who is being so directed along some broad science theme of common interest will be naturally become such a bridge for the people who really want to do that science. And so loose exchange rate details are negotiated in the actual contracts. I don't represent the observatory or the agencies, but it just provides some guidance of one full-time effort for uh, an astronomy aware software engineer. It can be more astronomy, more software engineer is rights for one PI and their group for the full survey period. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to take your questions now. Great, thank you very much, Michael. Wonderful talk. I'm, uh, uh, I'll ask uh, people around for questions. Please raise your hand, use the Zoom option of uh, raise hand and I'll go um, one by one down uh, um, the list and unmute you. I, we already have a question up there for, um, from Amaya. Go ahead, I've unmuted you. Please go ahead and unmute your, your audio and ask the question. Yes. Amaya, can you do that? Can you, uh, can you unmute? Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Ask your question. Yes. So I wanted to ask a question. I have two questions. Uh, I think you have briefly. Uh, Kanak, Kanak was masquerading as his son. <laughs> okay. And I was, I was thinking who Amaya is. Okay, good. Go ahead. So yeah, yeah. I am using his like laptop. So. Oh, good. <laughs> so I have two questions. 
so at some point, I can you briefly mention like about the, the surveys over one year and 10 years. So I wanted to know what would be the confusion limit in U band in one year and then how does it improve over 10 years? Okay. And then I have another question like now for this. Should I ask right away? Uh, yeah, go ahead and ask. I think I can remember two things at once. We'll okay, see. thanks. And I think uh, I wanted to know, you, you, you have been mentioning at some point that a deep drilling field. So mm -hmm. I wanted to know, if, do you have any plan on, on going on like you know, deeper surveys in some, of, some part of the sky in, this, in the Southern Hemisphere? Thank you for the questions. Um, I, I appreciate both as important things to, to clarify and emphasize more. Let's so see, you were asking about U-band specifically, yep. where I listed one visit and then the 10 years. Um, and this is just for some rough math here. There are something like 100 U-band visits. If the sensitivity goes as the square root of time, so we take the square root of 100, that's 10. We take 2.5 times a log, 10 of 10, we got one times 2.5. So we got 2.5 magnitudes fainter. That's a really simple way to discuss the difference between you know, that first row and the second row. The details are a little more complicated, but that's basically what you'll see. So U-band is not getting as many observations because U-band observations when the moon is bright are pretty um, inefficient uh, use of telescope time. Um, you asked about confusion limit. Was that was that the question? Yes, go ahead. I think. That yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. So. If so. Um, actually, you band. I'm not worried about the confusion limit nearly as much, uh, except near the galactic plane. Um, so the image quality we're hoping to get is around 0.7 arc seconds, and. Um, the things that are bright in U-band are quasars or things at much lower redshift, right? So for something at redshift two to be bright in your U-band, it has to be really bright in like, I don't know, a thousand angstroms or something like that. And that density in the sky is much less. You can look at the Galax survey and get actually a pretty good idea of what that looks like. Um, so I think the U-band confusion limit outside the galactic plane um, won't be that dramatic. I think in R and some degree I, where we go the deepest and the galaxies are bright, uh, I mean, the redshift to galaxy light is still significant. That's when um, almost all sources are gonna have something like that. At least 50% of the sources will be blends with something else. And even if you say, oh, well, I have this galaxy, I totally get it you are now sensitive to the fact that maybe there's some background galaxy or redshift three, that's some little speck in there and that's messing up your measurement of the outer wings of that galaxy that you really thought you could do those low surface bright measurements on. And, you know, right? Like remember the cluster images of the inner cluster light. What is the sky background in that region? Oh, I don't know, <laughs> right? There's all sorts of stuff in there. So those are the details where I think the confusion limit will be hardest. Um, as a person who actually has technical expertise in image processing, um, I find such challenges really interesting. Uh, but if you just wanted the answer, uh, it will take more thinking and be a little more complicated. Tanuk, does that ask, un answer your question? I've just unmuted you again. Uh, yes, yes, thanks. So I wanted to know that. Um, so it, so you, you were saying something like that the Galax like, you know, would do a better in NUV, but Oh, I meant the well, Galax survey I mean, gives you a sense of what the sky looks like in the FU in the FUV and NUV. Many of those galaxies are at lower redshift, but if you took those same galaxies and put them in high redshift, you'd have a sense of what that confusion is. And the answer is the sky is um, much sparser in you. That's all I was trying to say. Okay, great. Let's move on to uh, next, the next question, uh, um, Shantanu. Shantanu Desai, I'm unmuting you. So I guess I have a science question and a technical question. Uh, so let me ask a technical question first. Uh, uh, so I guess maybe I missed this. What is the image quality which you hope to achieve the seeing and uh, what are the associated risks 
uh, involved in achieving that. Uh, and can I ask my science question also now? Or sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I, I guess you mentioned it's a uh, LSST is a dark matter telescope. So let me uh, this if, if you think of it from a pessimistic point of view, right? I mean, despite hundred years, I'm sorry, ninety years, we still don't know something as rudimentary as whether the dark matter particle is a fermion or a boson. So I guess. What is the one, the main thing LSST will contribute towards the dark matter? Will it rule out alternatives to lambda CDM or will it sort of probe the uh, power spectrum to very small scale such that we can actually distinguish between uh, different CDM candidates such as a WIMP and an Axion? Uh, this is a great question. So the first technical question, um, nominally something like 0.7 arc seconds is the goal. Um, we've been doing site surveys, there's careful design of the dome building, and actually I didn't discuss this, but careful design of the ventilation and louvers, and that will really take in-place testing once we have all the things together, the dome together, the telescope mount assembly and the mirrors together, to really understand how to best maximize the, the flow through there. But the wavefront sensors mean that we're getting uh, real-time data. We're not going to actively control the mirror. Um, or sorry, we're not going to adaptively control the mirror. I'm trying to get my terms right. So adaptive optics is when you're controlling it like at 100 hertz or something like that. We will actively control the mirror, basically meaning that between exposures, we might make one change based on what we learned from the previous exposure. And then, of course, we'll have a map of deflections and stuff as we look across the sky. So I'm actually optimistic that that will be fine. Um, I think the biggest risk. I think the biggest risk to me is not precisely image quality. I think it's just weather. We have some model of what we think the weather is going to be like for these next 10 years. And there are fluctuations on those time scales. Um, so I, I think in terms of large scale things, that's what I'm worried about. Um, there are lots of little things, of course, that can go wrong. But it's been a pleasure to be associated with this project and see what real engineering looks like see what people who actually believe that contingency is a thing you should plan for <laughs> and believe that things going wrong is a thing you should plan for um, has really been great and uh, gives me a lot of confidence that things are going to work. I mean, just the construction and completion of the camera has been a remarkable thing uh, and seeing the things come together on site. The science question. Oh, I've almost talked so long that I forgot. Wait. Uh, no, I forgot. Sorry. It's about the dark matter and what kind dark of matter. Okay. Oh, so will I say dark matter telescope, dark matter this, that. Will LSST actually help us understand what dark matter is, which is different than will it help us understand how dark matter is distributed in the universe? And certainly LSST will do a fantastic job of how dark matter is distributed. But the specific question of what it is in the particle sense, it's less clear. So actually there is a specific group uh, that was formed um, uh, nominally within DESK uh, by Keith Bechtel, Yayo Mao, and uh, Alex Derlicka Wagner, specifically trying to figure out, okay, in concert with having all done all these detailed analyses to figure out all these things about structure growth and control of systematics and all that, can we learn something about the actual astroparticle nature of dark matter? Maybe still indirectly, maybe still you're looking at some ineffective in the early universe or something, but maybe you're looking at the details of interactions at 10 kiloparsec scales. So such efforts are underway. I am, um, it's, it's not what I do. So I think I'm less enthusiastic. They'll come with clear answers. And let me put it this way, the opposite question, Let's say that there's a direct detection experiment that finds something in a lab under some mountain and says, this is it. That doesn't actually directly help me understand my cosmology better that much at all. So I think I'm optimistic on both those fronts that both cosmologically and in the labs that we will make significant progress in the next decade about that. Um, and I think your question remains the right one. How do we integrate those two things together? How do you take for example, the cross sections of the energies that you would have measured for that direct detection experiments and map that to what's happening on the galactic scales and cluster scales, where the inter energies, the interactions are gonna be different. I don't know. I, I did say wrongly that 
uh, our LIGO colleagues were not here at all. And here I find the next question is from Sukanta Bose, who apparently is listening to both the LBK meeting and you. Uh, Sukanta, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you, Michael, for a nice talk. Um, uh, my question is about, uh, if you could uh, tell us if um, LSST has settled on a strategy like break cadence to chase uh, um, uh, counterparts, transient counterparts of GRBs or specifically LIGO candidates? Right, that's a great, great question, of course. Um, thank you for asking it because I sort of didn't uh, talk about it. So for about 10 years, um, about 10 years ago, there's the request of, let's at least make sure we have the capability to respond to a target of opportunity. Not a commitment, but that's how the survey will be run, but at least the technical capability. And that's totally there. Um, at the time, this seemed a little more like, uh, right? And of course, it's gotten a lot more exciting. And then the question becomes a little more specific. So what is LSST really good at? It's really good at covering area quickly and deeply. And it's just better than anything else at that. On the other hand, you could take the dark energy survey camera and get lots more time on that. So how should we balance that out? So this is basically a science prioritization political decision. I think my personal, my personal feeling is we certainly shouldn't spend more than 1% of the time chasing things in the following sense. If the localization is at many hundreds of square degrees, yes, LSST is a good way to chase that. But you still need something else to supplement that. And you probably should only do that a few times. I don't think I don't think it's the right use of it to turn the Rubin Observatory into a pure dedicated uh, gravitational wave event follow-up. On the other hand, this is an immensely exciting area of science and it would lead to some key early results. So there's gonna be the desire to, to do that. Um, so the exact thing of how much time will be there. I think the optimistic thing is it's just doing a survey. You can kind of interrupt it at any time. There's no particular image is any more special than any other. So there is that opportunity and how much of that time will be up to basically the equivalent to the survey planning um, committee you know, the equivalent of the Telescope Allocation Committee and, and the Operations Director. Thank you. But, but, yeah, yeah. Great. But I would just say, if I really wanted to do this, I would instead just go ask for 100 nights of the Dark Energy Survey camera time. I think I can cover much, much more with that. I mean, the, the argument that I really wanted to follow as fast as possible in the first couple of minutes is true. But I think in the overall science, you'll learn a lot more by matching you know 10 events within 10 minutes then taking all of the time and not doing the other science and just doing this yeah i totally understand thanks oh and i should actually mention one more technical thing lsst is uh, the, the rubin observatory oh i should mention okay so just naming it's the rubin observatory the telescope is the charles simone telescope because people kind of like telescopes being named after them not mirrors but in recognition of those contributions that's the telescope but um, it takes two minutes to switch a filter. So if it's in the filter you want, great. But if you wanted multi-wavelength coverage, which you probably really did because you wanted to know if that was a red transient, LSST is not the right instrument for that. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, that's an important point. <laughs> thanks. Great, thanks. Uh, let's go to uh, Firoza next. Firoza, I'm unmuted you. Firoza, please ask your question. Uh, you hear me? Yeah, fine. So thanks, Shoma. And that was a really good talk. Is it unmuted now? Yes. Yeah. LSST was supposed to cover a very wide range of science from looking for uh, exoplanet uh, candidates via transit, etc., all the way down to very quick transients. So have you actually frozen the cadence at which each region of the sky will be surveyed in each filter? There was That was uh, still a matter of debate a few years ago when the question of India participating in LSST came up. 
So it'd be nice to hear now if that uh, cadence has been frozen or if it's still flexible and can be sort of, you know, arranged according to, to the science interests of the collaborators. Yeah, thank you. I didn't, I didn't sort of dwell on the, on the, the discussion of given all the technical specs have been decided, what are you actually going to do with the telescope becomes a very key and interesting, important question. So um, a variety of survey optimization um, simulations have been run and are being analyzed now uh, for how that benefits different science cases. And then based on that information, there will be a committee probably put together by the current science advisory committee, which is advisory to the um, observatory director um, on, they will put together a committee to decide what the cadence should be. I'd say that the basic idea of covering the whole sky and the basic number of 800 visits across all filters over 10 years for the wide field is pretty robust. Gotcha. There's just not that much you're gonna change about that. All right. As a supernova person, some of the interesting questions though are how do you use that time? For example, I study things that have time scales of three to six months, mm -hmm. six months at redshift one, right? So I would much rather, if you're gonna observe a field just a few hundred times, spend a lot of those observations in the first three years for one part of the sky and fewer in the rest. So I get more supernova that have been well sampled. Okay. If I were doing AGN, mm -hmm. I sort of want something like that, but I probably want logarithmic time sampling. And actually for discovery, for lots of things, you probably want logarithmic. If I wanted fast um, transients, mm -hmm. then I probably want a deep drilling field where you set maybe took 50 images a night of just that, which might be more than other people wanted to do about that. But um, that'd be one thing. Uh, you mentioned exoplanets in particular. Yes. Uh, because uh, let me elaborate a bit. Please, yeah. We were, we were talking at some time about not only looking for, uh, you know, massive uh, exoplanets, massive Jupiter type exoplanets around sure, close to the host stars, but also distant exoplanets around the host stars. That is to say transit time scales of the order of once every two years or three years, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you had to sort of vary your cadence of observation in the hope that you will also pick up these objects as well as the other ob fast transiting objects. That was the debate that was going on at some point. Um, I, I haven't thought about this in detail. That seems somewhat related to on what time scales am I covering? Yes. And, and in general, I don't want to have actually done it on a fixed uh, every one month cadence. I want a more broadened time sampling for a whole bunch of different reasons. Yeah, I mean, there was some talk of doing some kind of a logarithmic time uh, yeah. cadence for each field. So has it uh, been, has it uh, thing come to us? I, I don't think for, for wide fields that will happen. I think for the deep drilling fields that will implicitly happen. Like it, it oh. won't actually happen, but you could reconstruct such a sampling. I see. Um, I think the efforts to do what are being called um, a rolling cadence, which is confusing to me because it means something different in my head, but um, we'll accomplish some of that. Of, I think of it as a sloshing cadence, but maybe that doesn't sound as professional, but you're sloshing the observations in time okay. for the different fields. All right. And I think that gets better time sampling for everyone. If you care about supernova, that gives you enough during that phase. If you care about other things, it really improves your aliasing if you can kind of spread that out. Now, some aliasing is always going to be there, right? Like the Earth takes 12 months to go around the sun and the moon goes around every month. Yes. And there'd be, there'll be imprints of those scales certainly in there. Okay. I'd say the one thing that's helped my thinking is to remember that it's 10 square degrees. Okay. So unless you are looking for strongly lensed supernova or other ridiculously rare things, there are probably at least a hundred things of interest in any field. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And, and that sort of changes that thinking of like, oh, I, you know, not necessarily how can I optimize, but is there enough to do my science in there? Yeah, so you can choose your cadence. Um, let's let's uh, go to the last question, last hand that's up. Can we go to Yogesh's question? Uh, Yogesh, I've unmuted. So we have other oh. questions. Oh, you have another one? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I was, uh, can I just quickly ask a second question? You had the uh, deep imaging of some five fields. 
which fields are these and uh, with what principle have they been chosen? I mean, they, they, oh, they, sorry, I don't have that slide. Um, oh, okay. There, uh, four of them are sort of the obvious southern fields. Mm -hmm. um, the cosmos on uh, at deck zero. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I just don't have that load in my brain. I should. Um, there are four fields that were chosen ten years ago, explicitly so that missions as a Spitzer or other missions currently could could plan and do those. Um, and which survey will you then, use for template uh, subtractions? Oh, template subtraction. Yeah. So so. Um, Template generation is sort of a whole different thing, but like once you have 20 or 30 images of a field, you certainly have enough to build a pretty deep template. For any okay, of the deep fields, right. that happens very, very quickly. Okay. One caveat, hmm. um, we, there's no atmospheric dispersion corrector. Okay. So to do observations at significantly different air masses, which yeah. actually you won't necessarily do for most of the field, you're just going plus minus 30 degrees. And if you handle your, when you observe during the night, you can kind of get that okay. okay. Um, you don't have to. But particularly in U band, and actually G, because G mm -hmm. is so wide, mm -hmm. um, we might need templates at different air masses. Uh -huh. There's a whole effort actually to do sub pixel level color modeling to generate templates appropriate for a given air mass to do that. Oh, but I wanted to mention one more thing about the coverage. So the um, the the um, field of view is is this like take a five by five grid and take out the corners. Yes. Yeah. As we tile, yeah, the fields will overlap. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, so sometimes you'll get two observations in a night, yeah. and sometimes you'll get three as those okay. hit in. Mm -hmm. So that also gives them different sampling, not for the whole field, but actually suddenly six percent or maybe even ten percent overlap okay. is a ten percent of eighteen thousand is a big number. Yeah, yeah. What? One hundred then. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Can we move on? Thanks. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Let's move on to the last question we have uh, here on Zoom. Uh, Yogesh, please uh, unmute yourself. Yes. Go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yogesh, yes. Okay. Uh, so my question was about the deep drilling fields also. So I just looked on the website. The four fields are two equatorial fields, which is the Cosmos field and the XMM LSS field. And there are two southern fields, which are the Chandra deep field south and uh, the LIS S1. So anyway, so my question, so this sort of answers what Firoza just asked. My question is about uh, what is going to be the cadence for each of these fields. And uh, I presume it's it is going to, these are small fields. So there will be just one pointing uh, in each of them. And uh, so the question is what is going to be the cadence and uh, how many visits uh, will we have uh, uh, for each of these fields? And uh, will the depth in each of these fields be the same or it's going to be variable? And of course, a related question, how was all of this decided? Uh, all that remains to be decided. Um, the Science Advisory Committee started a process about a year ago where people submitted their proposals and their priorities, a set of new simulations um, of what the observing cadence could be uh, were done a couple months ago and are being analyzed and the report will come out at some time and determine it, uh, advising you know, what works together, what doesn't work together. And then later next year, under the current plan, I believe would be a sort of a subcommittee to come together to look at that and come up with co some coherent plan. And of course, I'm just giving you that structure because all of these exact scientific political discussions um, about whose science is more important or what trade-offs you should make, here's this awesome case. But if you don't do this case, these 10 other things can be much better. You know, those sorts of trade-offs are hard. Um, so that will happen, I think, being part uh, Anyway, if you, I, I can send some specific follow-up on what the statements have been to date, but I think the real answer is yes, that's still being argued over. I think the deep drilling fields, some people would like nightly cadence. Um, I'm not gonna quite achieve that, but you might for some patterns, because again, for the deep drilling fields, you might say this year, we're gonna do this one a lot. And the other years we're not. I'd say at least an order of 10 times more exposures for the deep drilling fields. And some of the deep drilling fields are easier to observe than others. 
Um, so that you know, one proposal for the fifth field would be something that matches what Euclid's going to do. And there are technical questions of: Do you mean one field? Do you mean ten square degrees? Or do you mean twenty square degrees? What's the trade-off right. between rotational and translational dithering? Yeah. Anyway, the, that's getting a little more okay. detailed. But yes, these are very much still active questions. Yeah. No, but if you just think simply in terms of which are uh, what is the area of the field that's covered to great depths at other wave bands, and that is usually much smaller than than ten square degrees. Uh, that's right. Because of the small field of HST and uh, Spitzer and right. so on. And so you, Euclid's Euclid's the only case where you drive to twenty square degrees. Yes. The other, there's no argument for spanning more widely for the cross. Yeah, absolutely. Let's conclude uh, uh, today's session. Thank you very much, um, uh, Michael. Um, uh, well, apl applaud you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there are uh, several um, uh, words of praise on social media. Uh, people on Twitter, as well as on the YouTube channel are, are saying it was a great talk. And I think uh, one of the great things that happened was that a lot of people from various other institutions all over India, particularly in the astrophysics, uh, in CRA here, as well as from, uh, from the Tata Institute and others uh, were all here uh, listening to this talk. And uh, you, you did say at the beginning that you would, uh, uh, wouldn't mind hanging on for another few minutes after this. Yeah, too, yeah. People had specific questions in a small group after this. So um, the talk is finished and people who were listening to the talk um, thank you very much for being here.